Welcome to One Mind Zen. Today's talk is given by Unsan Chita. Buddha Sharana Gachami Dhamma Sarana Gachami Sangha Sarana Gachami You may encounter that chant every now and then um, in Zen temples uh, in the Five Mountain Order will often include that in um, some of our more formal ceremonies. It's known in a lot of Zen centers as the Pali chant which leaves out like 83,999 other things that are chanted in Pali, but we'll go with those three lines. And what they are, um, are the refuge vows. I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, and I take refuge in the Sangha. And uh, the lowest, most basic, lowest sounds kind of inferior. So we won't use that word, but at its basic level, taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha is essentially what makes you a Buddhist. The act of taking refuge. And step two might be to take the five lay precepts and go on further from there. And that'll be pretty much uniform across, uh, I would imagine, all uh, Buddhist uh, sects. Um, so I would say that of those of us in the Dharma room this evening that a full 75% of us were not born Buddhists. Okay? 75% of the people in this Dharma Zoom room this evening were not born Buddhist. There may be other Zoom rooms and dharma rooms and temples where the percentage is much higher. Uh, the, the Buddhist convert in the West is fairly high. I, I would hesitate to say that it's the majority of Buddhist practitioners in the West because there are a lot of Chinese, Korean, and Japanese uh, immigrants or uh, families that may be practicing um, on, their, on their own. So they may be the largest segment of practitioners. But other than what is the, the baseline of taking refuge, what is our practice? What is our Zen practice specifically? Um, Bodhidharma, first patriarch, uh, the percentage may just have changed. I see another face attempting to join. Bodhidharma, first uh, patriarch in China, uh, tells us uh, what the practice is. 
Many roads lead to the path, but basically there are only two, reason and practice. To enter by reason means to realize the essence through instructions and to believe that all living things share the same true nature, which isn't apparent because it's shrouded by sensation and delusion. Those who turn from delusion back to reality, who meditate on walls, the absence of self and other, the oneness of mortal and sage, and who remain unmoved even by scriptures are in complete and unspoken agreement with reason. Without moving, without effort, they enter, we say, by reason. To enter by practice refers to four all-inclusive practices, suffering injustice, adapting to conditions, seeking nothing, and practicing the Dharma. And as I said, that's uh, from Bodhidharma's outline of practice. And so he pretty much spells it out. This is our practice. This is what we do. This is how we get here. And this is what we do once we're here. Um, we've all, to some extent or another, at least uh, a large percentage of people in this room, anyway, have entered through probably a sense of dissatisfaction with whatever religious practice or lack thereof they may have uh, grown up with. Most of us here have chosen to take refuge. I suppose we could go to 100% in saying that we have all decided to continue to take refuge and not divert from the path. You'll often hear um, that line in there about uh, being unmoved by, even by scriptures and people using that as an excuse not to read the sutras or study um, the writings of the great masters, patriarchs, and sages of the past. Of course, the irony is there that they read that rather than came up with it on their own. So that kind of shoots their argument down pretty quickly, but not all agree with me on that. When we move into Zen practice and take it beyond the initial step of just going somewhere and sitting in silence, maybe staring at a mall, maybe staring across, maybe staring toward the Buddha. There are ways that we uh, perform that, that act of moving on. Uh, some sects of Zen will practice Shikantaza, which is uh, just sitting the Soto sect and the Kaodong set sects in China. Uh, that's their practice. Uh, a lot of people misconstrue what just sitting means. It's like not just sort of laying around or sitting, getting on a cushion and hanging for a while. It's, it's a little bit more demanding than that. Uh, and spoken as a, a former Soto practitioner, I had that pointed out to me a number of times. Uh, in Chan and Son, we'll uh, often use the uh, koan, kongan, uh, and wadu as, as methods toward furthering our practice. 
basically we're simultaneously instilling great doubt and doing away with doubt. It's kind of interesting, but it's Zen, so there's plenty of paradoxes to go around, aren't there? Um, there were uh, a lot of responses that I got a while ago. I sent out uh, some questionnaires, let's say, to various and sundry uh, practitioners I knew that were ordained, I guess they were all ordained anyway. And it was basically how they uh, came to practice Zen and how to how they might have gone um, a little further down the road than just, you know, popping on a cushion once a week and uh, being done with it. And there were some interesting ways that people uh, entered the stream. They ranged everything from uh, if you remember the image of, uh, I think it was 1963 in Vietnam, there was the image of the uh, monk who was self-immolating uh, in protest to the uh, Diem re regime. Um, others, conversely, entered by way of something a little less serious. I know there was one person who That was Unsan Chita. Uh, because of the TV show Thank Kung you for Fu. joining us at One Mind Zen. And there were others that entered One Mind uh, Zen is a sangha in the like five the mountain the Zen order in the lineage of Sung San and, and Tik Tian An located in Northampton, Massachusetts. Some sort of Dissatisfaction. Welcome to One Mind Zen. And it's kind of interesting that you enter with death. Today's talk is given by Unsan Chita. That the first noble truth is all about dissatisfaction, and, and Buddhism gives you a way beyond that. It's like, oh, okay, pretty good deal. I think I'll stick around for this for a while. Um, but again, the question is. What is our practice? Is it, does it even necessarily involve sitting on a cushion? Does it involve chanting and kongans or just sitting? Does it inv uh, involve uh, reciting sutras or reading sutras? <clears throat> Uh, if you were to ask Bodhidharma um, to give instruction to uh, the more advanced practitioner, his response may go something like this. Then again, maybe not. But... I'm giving it good odds that it might involve something like that. The great way is beyond scriptures and ceremonies and meditation forms and bowing and doing prostrations. But let's not get it twisted. Our dissatisfied mind that brought us into the practice, our deluded mind, our ignorant mind, is not the great way. We may all have Buddha nature, but there's a lot of times when we aren't quite acting Buddha-like. My, one of my Favorite sayings of my own is, if you want to be a Buddha, do Buddha stuff. I'm articulate that way. Um, so, rather than eschewing reading and chanting and bowing and meditating, 
even if we know full well that that's only the outward vestiges of the practice, they do serve a purpose. And the purpose is basically, uh, to quote from the film Coolahan Luke, to get your mind right. Now I have to not want to say, spend the night in the box. Don't say it, don't, oh damn, I just did. <clears throat> so if you think, even though the great way is beyond chanting in scriptures and, and bowing and sitting on a cushion, if you don't do them, there's a really good chance your mind won't be right. And even though you'll see Zen Sangha's named ordinary mind or even the original mind or one mind and think that, oh, okay, well, mine's pretty, my mind is pretty ordinary. I'm there. Probably not. There's a real good chance that it's called Buddha nature, not just plain Buddha or Buddhahood even. It's your nature to be awakened. But unless you're doing some Buddha stuff, you ain't getting that nature out. So in closing, let's continue to practice. Let's do the chanting and the bowing and the meditating and read the scriptures and the great sages and patriarchs and our current teachers and pay attention to what they have to say because they are our teachers, either in print or in person or over a video call. Let's not just give lip service to the Wadu. What is this? Don't know. Parrot. Say it like you mean it. When you say, what is this? The response should be really deep down, deep felt, don't know. When you take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, take refuge in them. There's a reason that we all got to this point. The dissatisfaction that brought us in, or maybe the comfort that taking refuge gives us whether we've been born into it or once we're in practice for a while take refuge in your fellow practitioners take refuge in the teachings and take refuge in the teacher that's not to say that there's some sort of great payoff like if you tick off the boxes, okay, I did this, did this, did this, did this. Okay, that means I must be enlightened. Yay. But I dare say, and there will probably be some who argue with me about this. There always are. But that if you don't do those things, if you don't, do things that help alleviate the greed, anger, and delusion, then you can pretty much figure out that no matter how boxes you think you've ticked, you ain't put up. So in a sense, we're all refugees. We're all taking refuge in the Buddha. We're all taking refuge in the Dharma, and we're taking refuge in each other. 
when we take refuge in each other, we're taking refuge in the Buddha in each other. So let's not even separate Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. They're not two or three sides of the same coin because there is no coin and there are no sides. It's all taking refuge. They're inseparable. Buddham Sharanam Gachani Dhamma Sharanam Gachami Sangam Sharanam Gachami I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. <laughs>